one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight, we have a very special episode with a very special person. His name is Sean McCraney. A lot of you may have heard of him. Some of you may not have heard of him. Sean McCraney and I go way back to about a month ago when we started trying to do this interview. And we have tried and tried and tried, but encountered technical difficulties on not one, not two, but three occasions. It wasn't working. So we tried it a fourth time. I came up with a brilliant idea, which I'm not going to share with you because it's so brilliant. It's a brilliant idea like plugging in the computer to make it work (laughs) After, after you can't get anything to happen three times in a row. But now it's working. Sean's here. From his location in Utah, I believe, Sean McCraney, how are you doing? Hey, hey, I'm doing well. It's so good that you figured this out, you technical genius. I am brilliant sometimes. Sometimes my muse works overtime. But Sean McCraney, we've also been going back and forth even as recently as just a couple seconds ago as to who's doing this interview. (laughs) Sean, this is very, very well planned, let me tell you. Whether Sean is interviewing me or whether I'm interviewing Sean, it may end up being a combination of both. But Sean, could you tell our listeners a little bit about you? I understand that you used to be a Mormon. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, Born and raised in Southern California. Oh, hey, Mormonism was very, very big in Southern California, at least back in the 1970s when I joined the church. You're probably not as old as I am. When was it you were in Southern California as a young man? 61 was when I was born, and I was I was raised uh, there until, uh, I don't know, whenever I got married, 85, 87. Wow, you are as old as I am. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just one year older than you. You just, you look a lot younger than I am. Well, it's that healthy Mormon living I still stick to. <laughs> Either that or it's the extra tequila on Wednesday nights. <laughs> <laughs> But now you're not a Mormon. You have gone through a lot of, if I can just say, notoriety. I was going to say fame, but I thought you might say, no, no, not fame. So I'll say notoriety, infamy, even in some quarters. You left the church. You became a born-again Christian. Is that correct? That's correct. And then you had a a big TV show. Is that right? Yeah. uh, What happened was uh, I... I, uh, was invited to come up to Utah and do a television interview on a full power television station up here about a book I wrote called Born Again Mormon. And uh, they usually, it was a live call and show and they usually did, uh, you know, got two or three calls. And after the show, they had over a hundred. And so that about a, two or three months later, the, the station manager said, hey, you want to do your own show? And so I started flying up here every week and doing a live call-in show from this full power station. And we were on for seven years, every week for seven years. Sounds like you were very popular. Well, I was popular and I was not popular depending on the audience and it was fun and it had its life. Uh, But uh, you know, we tried to talk about all things Mormon, had live uh, call-in people, a lot of them LDS debating and arguing and calling me names and me getting mad. uh, you know, I, I had never done television before, and, and I was just, a, I was just a, a Christian for only a few years, so I was learning as I went, and you can see me go through the learning curve, and it can be embarrassing. That's amazing. What was the best name you got called? Oh, uh, I don't know. Probably a fucker. <laughs> can I say that on the show? Well, um, I think you did. <laughs> I mean, I don't have an advance uh, or any, any way to try and... You didn't beat me that. out? <laughs> no, but we're not live. So I can go back and beep you if the spirit so moves me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you got called that on live TV? No, not on live, on live TV. It was usually I'm the spawn of Satan or something religious. But on the street, you know, uh, it would be that. Okay. Yeah. So people and, and people were, still recognize me from that show, and, and, and usually they're just quiet, and they just stare and whisper to each other. When did that seven hours, uh, seven in the hours, excuse me, seven years of the show run? It ran from 2006 to the last week of 2012, all the way through 2006 to 2013. Fascinating. I just want to go back a little bit before that and ask you how it was that you came to part ways from the LDS Church, because... 
you were probably a good Mormon boy. You were faithful. By the way, did you serve a mission? I did. Uh, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, and uh, called to two years. And while I was out there, they changed it to 18 months. Mm-hmm. The mission, I enjoyed it. I liked it. It gave me, it gave me rigidity, and it gave me rules, and I followed them, and I was obedient. Uh, uh, assistant to the president for more than half of it. Wow, really? Yeah, I really liked it. I, I really hate to break this to you, Sean, but if you're getting rigidity on your mission, you're probably not being totally obedient. <laughs> we discourage rigidity on the LDS missions. Did you not no, have one of those little white handbooks that talked about that? Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, yeah, I wasn't experiencing that kind of rigidity for the first time since fourth grade, so I don't know. <laughs> but really, you were an assistant to the president because that's very much a high mucky muck in the mission field. Yeah, well, you know, it, it is to some people. I could see all it was was personality at the time, but I thought it was inspired by the Lord God Almighty. And I took it seriously. I came back and I was a really quite the prick. I really thought I was something. And uh, I really was arrogant in my, uh, in my ways, my friend. And uh, that lasted for quite a while. But it was about a week later that I realized my rigidity was going to overtake me. And when that occurred, I realized I hadn't changed in my inner self of what I was as a teenager. I simply had... Uh, played a role of a leader and it was fake and it was false. And that began the decline. What was it you think that led you to that realization? Because that's an amazing thing. I know a lot of people who are the way you describe yourself as having been. I know fewer people who realize it. Like I tell people, look, I'm an asshole, but I know I'm an asshole. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know. I really, uh, I, I mean, it's serious. I'm, I mean, I'm serious when I say this, I really resonated to the punk movement and the punk movement is very much, uh, focused on authentic, authenticity. And I, I really valued authenticity. And I found out that I lost a lot of that on the mission and I, and I replaced it with inauthentic, role playing of thinking that I was someone special. And when I got back from the mission and I realized that, you know, I had propensities that had just been buried and they came out after a week, I realized I was a freaking phony. I really did. And that bugged me. And that phoniness is what wore away at me until I realized uh, I can be authentic, but I can't be a member of the church and be authentic. So everything you learned about authenticity, you learned from punk music. I, I really think I learned from the, from the punk uh, credo of, you know, be who you are. Don't, don't apologize for it. To hell with everybody else. You do what you do. You think what you think. You say what you say. You be who you are. And, and you move forward. And who I was, RFM, was a guy who really was interested in God and who really loved sin. That's who I was. And I couldn't make those things work as a Mormon. Why do you think, and by the way, when I talk about everything you learned about authenticity, you learned from punk rock, I'm only saying that partially tongue in cheek because I want to ask you what may seem an obvious question to you, but I think it's an important question, which is why do you think you were not able to learn authenticity as a member of the LDS church? Well, I mean, you, you probably are, you know the answer. Yeah, uh, and, and that is... Um, Mormonism, uh, your exaltation, your, your salvation is predicated on your holiness and worthiness and righteousness. And when you're not righteous and holy and worthy from the heart, uh, even from the hand you can be, but from the heart, if you're not, there's going to be a disconnect. And that disconnect was ever present in my psyche. I knew I was faking it. And, and I kind of could laugh at myself because you know, I'm showing up to a high council meeting and my hands are all torn up from, from beating them against a, a bag without gloves to, make, to bring some kind of pain or feeling in myself. And, and I'm sitting in a, in a room full of high councilmen with a suit and tie on and I'm playing a role and they can see, they can see I am deteriorating, but, but I, I was playing the part and they allowed it because I wasn't going against the church. 
And, and I know that sounds kind of convoluted, but in the end, um, Mormonism demands a conformity. And if you are somebody who is a nonconformist, you really cannot um, abide there authentically. You can abide there falsely, but not authentically. And that was the disconnect. So when you said about a week later, is that a week after your mission? Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. A week after the mission, I was in the truck driving, delivering some stuff for a job I had. And uh, I, I just had these uh, reactions to traffic and to women I was seeing and to life around me. That was the old Sean. And while on the mission, I had really let, buried that guy. And so I realized that I had only preoccupied him with service and with uh, diligence and role playing on my mission. The real Sean has, was not dead. He was alive and well in my heart. And he only began to thrive a week after and he continued to live until 1997 when I had a roadside experience and was changed. 1997? Yeah, 1997 was when everything kind of came into uh, clarity for me and I started to leave the Mormon church. So is that about 15 years after your mission? I call it uh, the 17 lost years. So whatever, I, I, that's what we say. Maybe my math is wrong. Well, I'm not exactly sure when you got back from your mission. So I'll trust your math over right. mine. So 17 lost years. Well, you told us what happened about a week after you got back from your mission, which is at the very beginning of those 17 lost years. Yeah. Was there anything else that happened during that time period because I mean I understand where you're coming from because I've got about 40 lost years okay okay but 17 lost years that is a long period of time to be lost especially when you have that epiphany one week after you get back from your mission about the authenticity yeah. what is it that happened during that time if you can take us through it give us a thumbnail sketch with maybe some highlights about those 17 years and why it was that you could not make it work as a Mormon well, what I did was prior to going on the mission, I was disfellowshipped for sexual crime, not crime, sexual sin. And because uh, I had slept with a bunch of girls and uh, they were going to excommunicate me because there were so many girls. But uh, the, my mom went to the bishop and said, if you excommunicate him, my whole family's going with him. And I learned about church politics then. So they decided to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they decided to fellowship, fellowship you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I went through the, the, the bishop's court thing. Uh, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, the person who delivered the papers for my excommunication to my house as a teenager was a member of the bishopric, who we later find out had slept with most of the women in the ward. But nevertheless, uh, talk about inauthenticity and, and playing the role. Uh -huh. I got this fellowship. I go on the mission. I get myself clean, repentant, straight. But <clears throat> when I went on the mission, I really dedicated myself to living by those white handbook rules. And so I never masturbated once. I never did broke any white handbook rule. And my, my companions can attest to that. I really made it a militaristic experience and I went full force. And so when I came off the mission, within a week, I realized that the Sean McCraney, who uh, was free now, who wasn't being regimented by white handbook rules, a mission president, a constant companion. Uh, the companion wasn't, my, wasn't the Holy Spirit. The companion was a companion. I realized in that week, I am still that same guy. And so what it did, what it, it, it caused me to start to search in those 17 years. So while I was made an Elder's Quorum president many times over, and I was put in a bishopric, and I taught early morning seminary, and I was on a stake high council, and I could have played the fast track had I been able to keep it together. Um, I, I was searching and I, and I started searching through literature and I started, I read it all anti-Mormon stuff, but I knew that, I mean, I could get the facts, but it wasn't doing anything. It wasn't changing me. French literature, existentialism heavily and, and Karl Marx. And I really studied uh, Marxism and, and, and Engels and Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin. And I tried to find truth in that. I tried to find truth in, nihilism and 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 i then i just totally went fell apart deserved excommunication in the last five years affairs with women uh getting drunk secretly taking hydrocodone uh, recreationally 
while still being on the high council and being in a bishopric. And, and, uh, I was, and I know guys who are like that. They're in it. They're trapped. They're mind screwed, but they don't know what to do. So it was over the course of those 17 years, I was searching and searching and honestly trying to find a, a solution to this impasse between who I was authentically and what the church demanded of me. Did you ever try and find a space within Mormonism for you to be authentic and still be Mormon? I did cartooning for Sunstone. I spoke at a few Sunstone uh, things. I tried to hook into them. I read Sunstone. Uh, dialogue was too high in for me because uh, I wasn't educated and I don't think they would have accepted me anyway. But I, I didn't find Sunstone as filling it either. I could have gone with John DeLenn's kind of way. John wasn't doing it then, but, and just kind of become a Mormon humanist of art and culture. I'm an artist by nature, but that doesn't fulfill it either for me authentically. It had to be something bigger. It had to be something that changed my heart because my heart, like you said about yourself, RFM, I'm an effort and I really am. There's no doubt about it. So something had to change that heart and it wasn't religion and it wasn't philosophy and it wasn't drugs and it wasn't women. So that's the road I was on for those 17 years. So what happens then in 1997 when you're in the midst of this existential crisis? At that point, it was a true crisis. I was at my wits end and I got in the car to pick up my daughters from a uh, gymnastics practice in another town. Costa Mesa, we lived in Huntington Beach, and I was driving and I flipped on the radio and a radio preacher who I later met, his name's Charles Stanley, asked a question. He said, if you can get yourself right before God, why haven't you done it? And that question blew my freaking mind because I had spent those years and even on the mission before trying trying to get right with him, trying to figure out what the hell I can do to get myself right. And I listened to him. And then he said, and the reason you haven't done it, so he's speaking directly to me, is you can't. And that was the first time in my life, even though I'd served the mission and talked to born again Christians and had them say all their stuff. First time in my life, I realized, okay, I can't. And when you realize you can't do it, then, you, then you're open to what can. And then he says, you can't, but someone did. His name is Jesus Christ, and he came to this earth, and he lived a life you couldn't and you wouldn't. And because of him, you can have a relationship with God because of what he did alone, not you, him. And so he goes on, and he does a, a, a call for to give your life to God. And I pray on the roadside and being Mormon, I'm thinking, you know, Heavenly Father and his son, Jesus Christ, and they're going to rejoice and I'm going to hear angels. And I literally giving my whole heart, pray, give me this change. I'm begging you and nothing happens. So I go to pick my daughters up and I'm early and I sit back in the car waiting and my mind goes back to three experiences I had growing up through those 17 years and even as a child. And my mind went to those three experiences that showed he has been calling me. He's been calling everybody, I think, but he was calling me specifically over the course of my life. And I remembered those three disparate, separated by years experiences. And I opened my eyes. My daughters were coming out of the gym and I was radically, radically born again from my heart. And what that said to me was you are fixed with who you are, your sin, your ways, by faith on my son. You are okay as you are because of what my son did. And when I realized there was nothing I could do, I was able to surrender. And when I surrendered that, he moved in. He was willing to move in. And when he moved in, he gave me a new heart and a new mind. And for the first time in my life, I knew I was Mormon. I believed I was praying to an anthropomorphic God. I believe the Book of Mormon could have still been true, that Jesus was my elder brother and Satan's spiritual kin. All of that didn't matter at all to me anymore. I was completely liberated at that moment. That sounds fantastic. 
It was fantastic. So and then, ardent in what I do. So then, what happens? Because now you're, excuse me, I'm shifting around to get closer to the microphone. So now you've, you're a Mormon. You're on the High Council at this time. Uh, no, I think at that time I had been released. Okay, but you're still thoroughly in, and you've got yeah. next, oh, family. thoroughly in. in. Yeah. What, what happens, and how do you tell people about this? I start to think maybe maybe that's what I should do. I didn't think I should go to a church. I did not think Christians and Christianity, evangelicalism was right. But I thought, well, I'm just going to talk, you know. And, oh, I was a high priest uh, group leader teacher. I was teaching the high priests. And I thought, I'm just going to start sharing what I experienced. And that's when I started getting kickback. That's when I started having people start to get into my life and push against me. It wasn't really uh, demonstrative. It was just in conversations. And then I would talk about grace of God and, and Jesus in the high priest group meetings. And I realized something was going wrong when the stake president uh, member, one of the stake, higher count, stake president presidency members, came and listened. And then he sent a memo to be read the next week that quoted Paul saying, we are saved by, uh, not, not Paul, um, work out your, Paul, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And he cited that. And when he sent that and he had the, the high priest group leader read that, I knew, okay, we have some kind of impasse here between us. I'm talking about something they don't get. And, and my idea to talk to LDS people while Mormon about being born again was not received. They did not want that idea. They, they liked the mighty change from the Book of Mormon, but they didn't really want this evangelical, I guess, sort of Christian view brought in. They wanted the works and the effort stuff to remain. And that began my kind of separation from it all. And after four years of being in and supporting my family and taking them to church, and I, I did that even after I got excommunicated. We, I was living in Park City, and uh, I went to the bishop, or sent a letter to the stake president and said, I deserve to be excommunicated. I want to be excommunicated because I want the, the ability to choose to come back to this church um, if I discover that I should and could. And I went to a tribunal with my wife, and they excommunicated me. Was that in 2001? Yeah. 2000, 2001, somewhere in there. What's going on with your wife during this time period? Where is she in relation to Mormonism and your experience? Uh, Mary has known me since I was 17. So she knew me when I was a, a, a faithful punk and uh, she knew my ways. And so, and she always said to people, I just want to ask God what causes some people to be so full of turmoil and angst. So she had seen me in those 17 years go through all these different approaches. And when I came home and told her I had this roadside experience to her, it was just another thing. So it, but she sat back and waited and wanted to see what, what, what's this going to amount to? But what was different for Mary at that time was that she saw an inner peace in me that she had never seen before. And she watched it grow in my relationship to her and her, her parents who were ailing and my children. And I became less of a jerk and I became more of a kind, patient man toward her. And it was that that ultimately brought her through. Um, when we went to the excommunication, she was appalled at the way, you know, they split the, the high council in half. They'll have six guys who are for you and six guys against you. And she was appalled at their approach from the guys who were against you. And one of them slamming his hand on the high council table and saying, who do you think you are? And <laughs> because she had seen the change in me. And I sat there and just listened to him. And I said, you know, I, I, I'm just someone who has been saved by grace through faith in Christ. and. And uh, anyway, though all those things culminated in years of her having to decide what she believed, and ultimately she came to see she wanted to be out of the Mormon church. She wanted to be with a man who had changed because of God. And every one of our daughters we gave, uh, we have three daughters, we took them to church, we supported them, seminary, stake dances, and, uh, but every one of them came to see a change in their dad 
and, uh, and, and what I was doing. And they came to faith and understood the difference between religion and relationship. Does that ultimately mean that your wife and your children have all left the LDS church? Yeah, and they all left officially about six years ago with letters saying we want our names removed. Okay, so it took them a while to join you. It, it did. They did not immediately join me. It was a, it was a good five to seven years before uh, I think I think one of my, my middle daughter came out first, and then they all sort of started doing the same. Mary was the last, I think, to come out. How about parents and other family members, both of you and of your wife? I know you mentioned your mom going to bat for you uh, before your mission. Is she still still with us? She's still with us. So is my dad. My dad, after my youngest brother, the youngest sibling went on a mission, he admitted his atheism and uh, he used the church as a social construct for the family. And so he was pretty much, he's still an atheist. He's 88. Great guy. Love him to death. Uh, my mom is was very ardent. She used the church um, for what the good it was. She wasn't sold out on Joseph Smith and and all that stuff. She was just a, a faithful, temple-going, temple-working, Relief Society president, but she really wasn't sold out on the doctrine. And uh, so they received me pretty well. My siblings, uh, and still today, the siblings are tough. I am alienated to some extent, even though they will now more so embrace me. They watch the shows, a lot of them, uh, which we still do, but uh, they're not, no one in my family has left Mormonism because of me. Um, the prophet has no honor in his own country. They know, they knew me from my youth and they're like, he's just, you know, still that guy. And so they don't see uh, or won't see anything beneficial to my having left. Right. Right. I understand. So you've got this time period now between 1997 and 2001 that you talked about. And 2001 was ultimately where you were excommunicated, correct? Right. And so then, please remind me, that TV show that you started, when you started on the seven years of TV show, what was, when did that start? 2006. So that's five years after that. Yeah. Can you tell us what happened during those five years? Well, those five years were preparation time. And what I did when I got excommunicated from uh, in Park City, uh, we sold the house, moved to Southern California. I left the securities business. I was a stockbroker with a couple different firms. I was a stockbroker at the time up in Park City. And we sold off that and we moved into an apartment. And I took a job as a uh, parking lot attendant at a state beach. I totally dropped everything. Now, I had been changed on the road uh, in 97, but in 2001 at the excommunication, that's when I severed ties with Mormonism. My older brother had killed himself. My older brother, uh, he's passed. That affected me. He was faithful uh, to the church outwardly, but inwardly was not, uh, could not be authentic. He ended up dead. So a lot of events took place. And when all those events sort of culminated in 2001, I said, no more. I've had a change of heart. I'm not going to be a stockbroker anymore. I am going to go about things differently. And I took a job taking parking uh, uh, fees at a state beach. And I wrote a book sitting in the kiosk and I called it Born Again Mormon. And I explained my, my walk and my path and, and everything that happened. The Christians hated it. Because uh, before it was even published, they said, you're going to be John the Baptist out there on a street corner trying to peddle this thing because there's no such thing as a born again Mormon. I said, really? I said, I'm a born again Mormon. I said, I was born again while I was a Mormon. That's what it means. That's not possible. I said, what are you talking about? Wake up. Give me a break. There's, a, there's, there's Christian born again Mormons in there all over the place. Your denominations are relevant to what your heart is like with God. And uh, it's mostly irrelevant. And then the Mormons, of course, hated it because in Born Again Mormon, I was espousing the notion that you needed to have the mighty change and and understand the grace of God. So no one really liked it. My wife and I self-published 2,500 copies with credit cards and put it in the garage of my in-laws. And they sat there in plastic wrap. And uh, for a couple of years, I built a little website. Nobody, nobody, I mean, we were excited when one person would come a month 
and, uh, and, and watched what we were trying to say. And uh, then one day I heard an announcement of a school of ministry full time at Calvary Chapel, which is a Christian school. And so I thought, wow, I'm still LDS. I, no, I wasn't LDS. I was excommunicated, but I was still attending. I didn't have a church. And I thought I'd try to get in there. And I applied and they let anybody in and they let me in. And there I had to go through the Bible uh, with Chuck Smith, who was our mentor. And he started the Calvary Chapel movement. And uh, I listened to him teach through the Bible verse by verse for two years, twice. And I really learned uh, what the Greek was saying. I really learned what the Bible was saying contextually. Not j- and, and Chuck was wrong on a lot of things, but I didn't know that. And I embraced those things. And uh, that was what I was doing during that time. And it was in my almost the uh, last second, I mean, last half of the last year, second year, I got a call from somebody in Utah who heard of this book, Born Again Mormon, from that little website. And so that's when I got invited to come on TV here. And that's when we got, got invited to do the show. And that's when we were doing the show, all the books started going and the ministry started to be built. Did you have to do a second edition of the book? Yeah, we've done three, actually. How many total have you sold or distributed in some way it's interesting and i you know, i gotta make this really clear we have i've written uh 12 books thus far and uh of those books born again mormon included we probably give 80 percent 80 to 85 percent of them away and then we sell the rest i i have a real difficulty that's a real funny thing in my mind with money and religion so uh, we give most of them away. If people are willing to buy them and can buy them, we'll take the money. And Born Again Mormon, we did 30,000, 33,000, I think, total books and, uh, uh, of the three printings. And uh, we've either given away or sold most of those. So you do this TV show now from 2006. I, it was it 2006 you start that? And it goes for yep. seven years to the end of 2013, I think you said. Exactly. Can you give us some highlights? Because you're flying every week for seven years from California yeah. to Utah and back. Yeah, every twice I, I fly in on a. Uh, oh my gosh, what did I do? I would fly in on a Saturday Saturday night, and I would fly out on Wednesday morning for seven years on JetBlue. And um, I sometimes I would sleep on the couch at the TV station. And um, we would do the show on Tuesday night. We still do it Tuesday night. And the highlights were the the very first show, I had three three by five cards with uh, some notes on them. And I started off and I just just kind of spoke my heart about being born again. Uh, My hair was bleached. It's really an embarrassing show. I didn't know what I was doing. And we went live and the first or second caller on that show was a BYU professor. And he's quantitatively, the book of Mormon speaks more of Jesus Christ than the Bible. What say you? And I'm like, oh, jeez. <laughs> I know the stats. I remember those. I read about those back in the 1980s. Do you remember the name of the professor? No, I don't. I don't. And, and it's, it's recorded. It's there. Well, I would just respond, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Now, I just spoke more about Jesus quantitatively than the Book of Mormon. What say you to that? Yes. But uh, I I was trying to take this approach of who cares if you're Mormon, stay Mormon, to just remove that off and be very kind and just talk about the things I had come to understand. And the problem with that approach we quickly discovered was that the LDS would just call in and say, this is great, we love you, we're all the same. And you know, you know, they just, they just embrace that as more uh, ecumenical love and that they have maybe the better way and we have a lesser way, but we're getting along. And when that professor called, I realized, no, I gotta bring the heat. If I don't bring the heat, people are not going to really understand. And the LDS are going to get misled and the Christians aren't going to get it. So I put on the heat, which was part of my nature, 
but it's not the best part of my nature. I, I, I realize now there's a better way to do things in my estimation, but for the time it was right. And tell, so, me, tell me about the heat and how you brought it on, Sean. I mean, I would just call people flat out, you're a freaking idiot. You're the dumbest human being on the face of the earth. How could you believe what you are saying without investigating that? And it was that kind of tenor that turned so many people off, but it also reached a great segment of society who wanted some kind of authentic exchange to go on for someone to call, someone to try to strip the veneer off the, the facade of Mormonism in Utah, especially, and to just really get to the heart of the matter, tongue in cheek, that's the name of the show. So we just, I mean, and, and the thing that was funny about it, RFM, is that, you know, being a host, uh, uh, that when you know sort of after a while what's coming, you know what someone is kind of trying to do. And so when you're doing a live call-in show and you've been Mormon, and then you have become a Christian and you have a caller who calls in and say, I really appreciate what you're talking about. And I think that it's beneficial. Um, however, you know, okay, what are you going to give me? With, and, and, and since I realize that all of their approaches are fallible and easy to shoot down if you just logically look at them, it became most of the time like, like shooting goldfish in a barrel. I know the prophet Joseph Smith is true. Okay, wait a second. You know he's true. How do you know he's true? You're just reciting something you learned as, as, a, as, a, as a kid in testimony meeting. Tell me, how do you know he's true? Well, I've prayed about it. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit tells you it's true. The Holy Spirit doesn't tell you something's true. If the person is false, if the person has provable falsehoods about them, how could they be true if they're also false? That was the kind of temperament of the show. They're still on uh, uh, YouTube all over the place. And most of the people who come to us are tuned in because of the Mormon shows. But the highlights were the calls uh, addressed almost everything uh, doctrinally, everything from a guy A to Z, uh, the topics, Mountain Meadows Massacre, polygamy ad nauseum, ontology of God, soteriology, back and forth. And at the end of the seven years, it started to become like, replay every caller no matter if it was a first time call or not if they were lds they were going to bring the same things to the table and i found myself repeating the same things and after that i started to get burned out and i'm like man i just can't this just isn't i'm not interested in this anymore and and i kind of lost lost interest in it did you feel like you were making any kind of headway in your mission we, we made great headway, and we know that from the emails we were getting. We were, we were getting at uh, one time about 10,000 emails a month, and of those, we were seeing uh, so many people who had left Mormonism because of the show. And that was not the problem. People are still leaving Mormonism because of the show and the facts of the show. We really tried to focus on the facts of the matter, but the problem was that it was not my intent. My intent was not to just have people leave Mormonism because that is a rub I have against anti-Mormon literature is that its whole purpose is just to get people to leave Mormonism. Well, you know, as a religious institution, it's probably one of the better ones, if not the best one on the face of the earth. And if you're going to be inculcated by doctrine and you're going to be part of a church and you're going you're to pay the price to do that, you might as well be a Mormon if that's all that matters to you. So I wasn't just about trying to get people to leave Mormonism. I was trying to get them to leave Mormonism for a relationship, direct relationship with Christ, whether they continued to attend or not. But we were having sort of the reverse effect because my approach was this anger and this vitriol and this combativeness. And what it did is it, it inserted that into the souls of people who were looking for truth and it gave them the chutzpah to leave the church, but they left it. And, uh, and they became, you know, godless humanists and, and, uh, and, and, and they didn't all, most of them did not leave for a relationship with God uh, through Christ. And that bugged me. What did you decide to do about that, if anything? Well, it really wasn't a uh, conscious decision. It sort of happened through an indirect way in 2000, um, 
12, the last year that we did the show in December, I made the announcement that we were going to take a break off because I was burned out. We we're going to take a month off and take a break. And my wife and I spent that month, the first time ever in seven years, going to the top 10 largest Christian churches in Utah. I had not been to them, but we had been helping fill their pews with congregates from the Mormon church who were just seeking because they came out of Mormonism. They didn't necessarily have a relationship, but they just were looking at different churches. So we go to these churches to see what they're doing. And I took a notepad and a pencil and we got there and we went to the 10 churches, uh, two or three a Sunday for the month. And what I saw there and what I witnessed there that was happening to people that came out of Mormonism was so reprehensible to me that I said the, the first Tuesday of 2013 on the air, we are not going to spend this year talking about Mormonism. We're going to spend this year with the same amount of focus, the same amount of heat, the same amount of truth, looking at the, the, the churches in the state of Utah and what they are feeding people relative to God and a relationship with Christ. Because most of them are just putting people back under another form of religious bondage, tithes, support the church, be a member, sign a worthiness agreement, all this bullshit, sorry, bleep. And <laughs> it was so offensive that I knew they could have a relationship by sitting in their car and asking God with an honest heart to change their life and he would do it. And they are putting people back in more religious bondage. So we announced we are going after the churches. Evangelicalism needs to be exposed. And within a week, they had me off the air. <laughs> a week after that? Yeah, I'm on the air seven years in Salt Lake City. The Mormons couldn't get me off. They had tried in different ways. They couldn't get me off. One week of saying I'm going after American evangelicalism and the pastors united and got me booted from the station. It was classic. Oh, my goodness. Well, yeah. how did that feel? You know, it was tough at first because uh, our show had really built that station. It had given them legs and, uh, uh, and it had purpose and was watched. Uh, so I kind of felt uh, offended by that. I felt lost a bit for about a week. And uh, I fought to get back on, but they were, they had made the decision. I had become way too radical for them. Um, but it was a blessing in disguise, so to speak, because what we did was we built our own church studio and we just went from live television uh, here to streaming. And that was right at the top of the curve because television's become nothing. That station was sold to a Hispanic station about a year later. It became nothing. And uh, we have now a live studio church where I can say exactly what I want whenever I want to the utmost authenticity with the most honest expression I can give. And that's what I try to give, what I honestly feel and believe relative to scripture. And nobody can pull the plug. And that's turned into a great blessing. We lost, uh, we, were, we were bringing in, and you know, this was not a money-making deal, but at one point we were bringing in almost a half a million in donations uh, on TV. And before I went on the air and- Can you hang on a second, Sean? Sean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I would just like my listeners to pay attention to the last part because I'm always after them to get them to donate to the program, the Radio Free Mormon program, Sean. And yes. hopefully this will be an inspiration to them. Donate to Radio Free Mormon. He can't do this without funding. Okay, <laughs> okay so you're making half a million, drawing down half a million a year from donations. I wasn't, yeah. But yeah, I was, I was bringing in about 100 grand at that time. Uh, but we had gone in debt. We had, we had financed the thing ourselves. So I'd have to justify it with that. But nevertheless, we were bringing in about a half a million uh, at the height of the show. And we didn't press, we didn't say give, you know, the Lord wants you to give. We just said, if you're in the position, if you're led and if you can, you know, give. But so we're, we're making that much money. And then I said to my wife a week before I went on the air to, to attack the Christian church, I said, you know what this is gonna mean, don't you? And she's like, I think, I said, yeah, we're gonna lose most of our base because this base is based on me attacking Mormons. 
and now we're going to flip and attack the Christian church. Those Christians are not going to support us anymore. And I was right. So we've lost about 85, 90% of our supporters, maybe even more uh, to this day. But in exchange for that, I was able to uh, uh, speak freely. I wouldn't be edited. And uh, we were able to then um, start to talk about things in Christianity. And I began to pull away from just picking on the Mormons, which are such an easy target in some respect, and to then pick on all religious institutions and the games they play and the things they do, which are not biblical, not contextual, and have nothing to do with someone having a relationship directly with God through Christ. I, I consider, uh, and the treatment I've gotten from the Christian community for my change has been a thousand times worse than the way the Mormons have ever treated me. I mean, the, the ex-LDS and the LDS, even, they've treated me far better with the stuff I used to say and do about Mormonism. The Christians, they, man, they are ruthless. And uh, I say the Christians sort of tongue in cheek. They're, they're really not Christians. What Christians kind of, by their love. These people aren't Christians. What kind of things do they do? Oh, they're, they're just, uh, they, they assassinate you relentlessly in public forums with, uh, with attacks on your character uh, by questioning your everything, your, uh, your intentions, your sanity, your, your uh, schooling. And the, and the irony of that is it's, they're heralding me as this great uh, voice uh, toward Mormons when we were doing the show. And then when the same voice with the same mind and the same logic goes after them, they say he's nuts and he's, oh, he went to a two-year full-time school. He's not, he doesn't have his MDiv and he's not qualified. If they just took all the things that they never used and now use it. And uh, they say, I'm a son of, uh, I'm a son of Satan. They say that, that I'm in Satan's employ, that I've left the, uh, uh, the faith. I haven't left the faith. I'm promoting the faith. And so it's really, really uh, divisive and it's dog eat dog in the Christian world of uh, apologetics. And you, you aren't free, you gotta play the game. And so it's all religion. Mormonism, I found it true to be for evangelicalism as well. I'm telling you, I'm pausing here because I am really shocked. I had done some background research on you prior to the interview, prior to the first time we scheduled the interview about a month ago. But um, yeah, and I'm finding all of these different Christian individuals, pastors writing articles and blogs about you and why it is that you're a heretic and going to hell. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's zealous uh, Mormons would say I'm going to outer darkness and hell too. You have that, that fringe, but it's usually not the leadership. And within Christianity, it's the pastors and it's the uh, ministry leaders who say this stuff. And it's fascinating. And I mean, it's what's really, frankly, the most outrageous thing about all of it is that over the course of this time, contrary to how I might be sounding right now, I've become a softer, better man through the Christianity I understand. And I have, I have died more and more to the guy who started that show in 2006. And my wife and kids and friends and family all can attest to that. I have become more like what we've envisioned Jesus to be like by him, not by me. And I have to make that clear. I have really learned through the spirit to die to that former guy. And yet as that happens more and more, the attacks from the Christian community become greater. The, the kinder you are as a Christian, the more loving, the more merciful you are, which is what God wants from us, the more forgiving you are of Latter-day Saints and the more open you are to their salvation, the more hateful the religious leaders become. It's an inverse relationship. And so it's stunning to me that when I prove through scripture that Christ saved the world, and that Christ gave his life for all people, all the time, everywhere. And that whether they believe or not, that shed blood is efficacious in their life. Homosexuals, 
LGBTQ, whatever. He saved them. God did his part in fixing our sin. The more hateful these preachers get, and they're usually Calvinists, who I have a real rub with. Why such a rub with Calvinists? I know oh, one, by the way. And I'm a good friend with a Calvinist. Oh, gosh. If he's a five-point Calvinist, I mean, first of all, can I ask you something, Sean, before I just open it wide for you? Because yeah. I would think that if I'm a Calvinist, okay, which mm -hmm. I'm not actually, but if I were a Calvinist, I would think that whatever it is that you're doing now, Sean, and whoever it is you're criticizing, that you were foreordained and predestined to do that from before the foundation of the world, and therefore, who am I to criticize you for doing what it is that God is having you do in the first place? Right. Doesn't make sense, does it? Not to me. No, <clears throat> but they, <clears throat> there's a segment of Calvin, I shouldn't lump them all together, but there's a segment of Calvinism, which are usually on the apologetic end, which are usually known uh, around the world of a Christian apologetics for being the, uh, the mad dogs of religious certainty. And they make sure that the doctrine is well policed. They go about and uh, there's several names out there. I've debated them. I've had them on our show. I've been, you know, I've, I've been on the brunt end. There's several names that come up always. They're known for their, their uh, debating. Um, they are the ones who are so destructive and so mean. And you're right. If God is sovereign in the way they describe him and he is in control of everything and there is no such thing as free will among human beings, then why are they saying a word? But So it doesn't make sense, but they are the most difficult, hard, unloving group uh, that I have ever met. And, I, and I've said this on the show, that I would take a faithful, loving Latter-day Saint hands down as a brother in, or sister in Christ over a five-point, ardent, apologetically driven Calvinist. You know, yeah, you'd mentioned earlier Charles Stanley. Now, I happen to be familiar with him, I don't know him, but I used to watch some TV shows back on uh Sunday afternoons in the 1980s when I was in college. And there's nothing to do on a Sunday after you've been to church as a Mormon because you got to be busy doing nothing to keep the Sabbath day holy. So I would turn on the TV and watch some of these shows. And I remember Charles Stanley now. Uh, I think he had a southern accent. Is he from Georgia or someplace? Yeah, where he would. Yeah preach. Well, you mentioned that uh, it was his message over the radio in 1997 that gave you that huge turnaround experience, but you also said you met him later. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we have, so we have a supporter in the ministry, and she had some, uh, uh, some tickets uh, to fly us first class. So my wife and I, we never flown first, and she flew us first class to Georgia to go and meet Charles Stanley. And um, we went to his mega church and you know, it's quite the scene. It's quite the studio. And, and uh, there's all sorts of, um, uh, what should I say, materialistic appeals uh, to what he does back there. But that might be the Georgia way. Anyway, my wife and I went in there. And uh, at the end of his service, they say, now, if you want to meet Dr. Stanley, come on up. And so we were, we went up and we sat in the front row and he had a line. And then when the line sort of waned, I, I charged up there and I just grabbed that guy and I embraced him. And he's kind of a coiffed, smallish, Southern genteel man. <laughs> and I think his security all kind of jumped for their guns. They were terrified at what was, they were seeing because I was shaking him and, and hugging him and telling him, and he must get that all the time. But that was my, he didn't have much to say to me. I just was so uh, overzealous with love for that message that changed my life. And that was the experience. Nothing else happened. Have you stayed in contact with him? No, no, no. I haven't stayed in contact with him. I think uh, Dr. Stanley, he does a great service in preaching the gospel, the peep gospel message. Again, as with most things in the faith, I don't agree with him on uh, a lot. And, uh, and I'm sure he doesn't agree with me, but uh, I have a great love for him and, and what he brought to my life. Well, I've got to ask you this question then, Sean. It seems to me, and I'm no expert like you are, 
but from an evangelical Christian point of view. I thought the idea was that you recognize that you're a sinner, that you can't do it yourself, that you need God, you need forgiveness, and then you pray the sinner's prayer to Jesus, you invite him into your life, you get saved, and then you live your life showing forth the good works of Jesus who's in you. Is that pretty much the fundamental idea? That's the idea. That, you know, it, the sinner's prayer is kind of a man-made thing, but nevertheless, that's what I did and it worked. But that's the, that's the main idea. The problem is between God coming in and saving you and you living your life. In that gap is where religion stick themselves back in, where, where God tore the veil down and he opened it up. They stick themselves back in and they take people who have had the experience and they say, now. Uh, so we accept you in your sin. Come to us as you are. We love you as you are, sinner and saint alike. Come to us gays. Come to us straights. Come to us drunkards. We love you. So you come to them and Jesus steps into your life and he says, I've forgiven you. And then they say, and now that you're forgiven, you got to do what we say. Now that you're forgiven, we are your masters. Now that you're forgiven, you got to serve the church. You got to pay us. And they give you a litany of things that you must do and must be, which is antithetical to the gospel message in the first place. Now, there's certainly, certainly a, a command in scripture for people to bear fruit. That, that is definitely what God wants from his children that have been saved by grace, for them to bear fruit. And scripture clearly shows that those fruits are love. And all the aspects of love, patience, kindness, all that stuff. So, but there's the premise of we are abiding in the vine, which is Christ, and we are branches. And he pushes through in us. And at the end of the day, we produce fruit. But branches don't produce fruit for a, quite a while. When they're young tendrils and those green twisty things on a vine, you're not producing fruit. You can't bear fruit. So you got to grow. And you need time to grow. And you need, you need time for people to be kind to you when your flesh is still raining. But the religions are, are, are legalistically demanding people to conform outwardly to their ways, which is nothing but Judaism all over again. And they don't allow for the spirit of God to do its work. And for people, individuals, whether they go to church or not, to have God work in them and change them. Religions never changed me. I've been changed by the spirit and that's the freedom that comes with Christ. You can mess up. The sin's been taken care of. I can go back and do a, a week of heroin, I guess. And God isn't going to punish me. He's not angry at me. He saved me past, present, and future. But the religions would turn their back on you if, if I went to heroin. They would turn their back on you if you get into an adulterous affair or if you say that you're a homosexual. They turn their back on you because it becomes your responsibility to say, keep yourself saved and to be pure for God to continue to love you. That's not the gospel message. Jesus paid for sin, past, present, future. It's done. It's over. We don't have to merit and earn our love from God. He loved the world so much he gave us his son. So that's the, that's the problem with religion. I have yet to find one that will embrace you as you are and your beliefs, your doctrine. You can, you, if you walked into a typical Christian church and you said, I've been saved by Christ and I believe God is a woman, they would kick you out within a week. But there needs to be a church that allows people to come in and say, I want to find out about this Jesus and I believe God is a homosexual and that's because that's what I am and I'm made in his image for them to say, great, sit down, welcome. Let's just, let's just learn the Bible together best we can and you're welcome as you are. Churches don't do that. Why is it that you think that churches go that way? And let me uh, go ahead and say that I've given this some thought over the years, and it seems to me almost inevitable that a church, by its very structure, is going to require things of its members in order to continue to exist, usually with the very reasonable idea that we need to continue to exist and expand in order to reach more people, to convert more people, to save more people. And yet it almost seems to be part of the system, 
whether it's wanted or not, that they're going to have to require some things of their members in order to fulfill their mission. Is that something that you see in other Christian churches? And how do you try and avoid replicating that in your ministry? That's a good question, uh, our, because uh, absolutely, and what you're witnessing and what you've seen, both in Mormonism, Catholicism, all evangelical outreaches, Billy Graham, is the fleshly idea. If we manage, if we manage these earthly institutions like businesses, and if we can manage them um, in terms of getting more participants, then we implement models that corporations use to get more business. And that requires a great deal of structure and therefore order and therefore demands and therefore more and more rules. And the example that, that we give at uh, the place that we gather together is forget all commandments. Let's just say in our group that I decide we need one rule. And that rule is everyone must wear socks to church. That's the only rule this, this church has. You can do anything else, believe anything else, but you must wear socks to church. So what will happen in that is that there will be some who will rebel and there will be some who comply. And the minute that happens, you have division. Then those, to those who comply, they're going to be people who buy Armani socks. They're going to be people who debeckle their socks with gems they're going to be people who wear only white socks and you're going to have division there. And then you're going to have the, the rebels mocking everybody. And so they're going to cause more division and they're going to have people who are going to wear socks on their uh, shoulders and saying, I'm wearing socks when it's not. So rules divide um, and, and, and churches use rules to unite. And by uniting, they become insular. And so anyone who can't or won't conform is outcast. And so what you do is you have a gathering of like-minded, like-thinking people, and you're constantly sifting through that, and you're getting rid of the riffraff. But the riffraff are usually the ones who need the most help. So you have to have, that's why we call ourselves Christian anarchists, you have to have a ruleless, no rules society, unless it comes down to somebody being in physical danger. So doctrine divides, doctrine kills. Doctrine is not what we're saved by. We're saved by, a, by Jesus Christ. So your idea of who Jesus Christ is doctrinally can be very different from mine. It doesn't matter. If you've had the spiritual epistemological change in your mind of who Christ is and in your life and it's work, that's fine. Churches use doctrines to maintain. And while it helps them grow in a systematic way, it also alienates most of the people who need to be in that church. So our position at campus is there are no rules to what you believe. There are no rules to how you live. There are no rules to your opinions. There are no rules to how you dress or what you eat or if you come in high. The only attempt we have at a rule is to love as the Bible describes love. And that's to everybody at all times. That's what I see the, uh, the model being for the church in this age, that it is about true agape, selfless love and not doctrine and not praxis. And churches have made it all about doctrine and praxis as a means to control, grow with their special little flavor of people that they want to create and mold. That's what Mormonism has done. Catholics have done the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, when you started talking about the socks to church, it made me think about this idea too, because once again, for a number of years, actually even decades now, back to the early 90s, I've considered this idea a great deal. And it seems to me that as soon as you have one commandment, yeah. you have opened the door. It is the camel's nose under the tent. Yep. And once you let that camel's nose under the tent, it's going to keep going in more and more and more. And what you said to me was very interesting, I thought, when you said that um, churches use rules to insulate themselves. Yep. And it strikes me that, and you also said rules divide. So it struck me that you can use rules with an attempt to identify yourself. We talk about identity markers, like Mormonism has identity markers, and other churches, I'm sure, do by the rules that they have. But at the same time, you're creating these rules to identify yourself. 
you're also creating division between yourself and others, and also ultimately between members of your own church who are not going to agree necessarily on the rules or how they should be applied. One thing you did not say, actually, I think you hinted at it when you said Armani socks, yeah. is that as soon as you get one rule in there, now you're going to have people, it's very natural. I don't think there's any church where it doesn't happen. I know it happens in Mormonism where uh, let's take the Sabbath, for example, keeping oh. the Sabbath day holy, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, now we start getting into competition, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. How, how well can you keep the Sabbath day holy? Do I, first off, we all go to church, right? We got to go to church. You got to go to all your meetings. I think we all understand that. But are yeah. you going to stay in your church clothes for the entire day? Right. Are you going to watch anything on TV after church? Right. And so I was converted by a friend of mine who was extremely uh, devout in the sense of keeping the Sabbath day. And it was very much, you know, uh, you don't watch any TV. I don't actually know that he kept his church clothes on. He wasn't that righteous. I almost said that bad. Yeah. But maybe it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't that strict, but it was very much, um, uh, you don't watch any TV on Sunday. And by the way, when it's fast Sunday, it's 24 hours and not a second less. That's right. And you got to watch the clock to know when you can eat again. Right? And, and, and brother, that's the Old Testament, isn't it? Well, it is. And you're just saying basically what Paul said about the law uh, killing. Yes. And the spirit giving life. Amen. You get that. Yes. It kills. And what it sets up, of course, is then for this division that you talked about, because it is really hard to do that without looking askance and down on the other members of your church who are not fasting for a full 24 hours or who are watching TV on Sunday. Right. Yeah. Or going to the store or whatever it is. So that's very, very interesting to me. Now, I did want to talk to you about um, your show. Yeah. Your show currently, that's the heart of the matter, or just heart of the matter. Uh, heart of the matter, yeah, heart of the matter. Is that still on Tuesday nights? Yep, so we stream out every Tuesday night, and Monday night, actually. We do two shows now. Monday's shorter, Tuesday's the live call-in. Still do it. What are your call-ins like now? By the way, before I forget, how do my listeners tune into your show to listen to you? Uh, best way is YouTube. Just type in uh, Heart of the Matter, Sean McCraney, or H-O-T-M dot faith. Uh, any of those, H-O-T-M, Heart of the Matter. Uh, you'll find me if you use my name, S-H-A-W-N. Um, the calls are pretty much dead for a couple reasons. Uh, I think live call-ins are starting to die more because the younger generation doesn't necessarily care about watching things live or not. And so they'll tune in later. Most of our viewers are not live anymore. So uh, the calls have diminished. We've changed over to reading more emails and comments on YouTube that people make. Uh, our, our best shows uh, streaming, you know, might have um, 10,000 views might. Most of them are down in the hundreds now. Uh, we've lost a lot of uh, viewers for because of a couple doctrinal stances I have. And, uh, but we do have a group of probably a thousand people who really do get what we're saying. And uh, they're, they're supportive and in it and watching and, and, and uh, they challenge and they don't believe me on everything, but that's really our core group now. Have you already gone over what those couple of doctrinal challenges are that you say have made you lose most of your viewership? I don't know if I've uh, uh, gone over them, but I'll just mention them uh, quickly because it's easy to summarize. I, the Trinity is a man-made farce. Um, uh, and I, I, I think, uh, but if you're a Trinitarian and that's how you see God, I love you, fine. But my opinion of it is it's a farce. I have, we have people in our group that are Trinitarians and they reject my view but they don't ostracize me or alienate me because of it. And that's the whole thing. But the Trinity is one. Uh, eternal punishment is another one. Totally Augustin, Calvin uh, promoted BS, uh, not supported by the Greek. Eternal punishment was never part of the uh, plan. Uh, another one is eschatology. 
Uh, and that's a big one because it frames the way you read scripture. My eschatology, which is my view of the end times, is that I'm a fulfillment person, meaning I believe everything from Revelation to uh, uh, everything from Genesis to Revelation chapter 19 has been absolutely fulfilled. And we now live in a new age. That means Satan is gone. He's over with. Hell is gone. It's done with. It's been fulfilled. And Christ has truly had the victory over all things. And that when we do evil, it's our own nature that's doing it. And our darkness is, is uh, in the hands of ourselves. And, but I don't believe there's going to be a Jesus coming to destroy the world. I think he came in 70 AD and wiped out that world, uh, uh, the law, Israel. And that eschatological stance changes the way you understand how to be a Christian and what it means today. So those are the main ones, hell, uh, eschatology, uh, trinity, uh, eternal punishment. I think those are the main ones. Well, let me just uh, comment a bit on that because the Trinity has always been something that's been very interesting to me. And by interesting, I mean hopelessly confusing. Yeah. I've tried to study it as best as I can as a Mormon. And generally it's in order to prove it wrong, right? Because that's yeah. why Mormons study the Trinity at all is to show that it's wrong. Uh, yeah. I once heard somebody, uh, it was not a Mormon. I think it was somebody, uh, a scholar of some sort who quipped, if you say you understand the Trinity, you don't understand the Trinity. <laughs> you ever heard that one? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I studied a little bit about it. And I think that I understand a little bit about the historical underpinnings, which I don't want to get into for purposes of this show. Yeah. But I've grown to the point where I'm 60 years old. I'm older than you. I'm a senior. You're a junior <laughs> in high school, okay? When I was a senior, you were a junior. So you got to look up to me. Otherwise, I we'll, do. Catch, we'll catch you in a push. Line. I'm afraid of you, too. <laughs> It'll be a push line after lunch, man. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but it just seems to me that if I'm God, which I'm not, by the way, I will be because Mormonism, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not God right now. Okay. But if I, if I put myself in God's position and I figure he's smarter than I am, okay, I'm going to take that leap. And he's probably more tolerant and understanding than I am. But even me right now, Radio Free Mormon is 60 years old. I'm thinking if I'm God and I'm, and I'm looking down at, my, at all of my children here on planet Earth and I'm thinking, you know, you, it's okay if you believe in me. Believing in me is great, but you have to believe in me in exactly the right way. Otherwise, you're going to hell. Right. That just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't, does it? Why would God care? I mean, I can understand wanting to have a relationship with his kids, you know, phone me on, you know, uh, Christmas, Easter, all the major holidays, my birthday, you know, <laughs> yeah. keep the lines of communication open somewhat. Don't just ignore me. But you don't have to believe that I'm the best dad who ever lived and, you know, all these other things that go along with it and the three and the one and all that thing with the Trinity. You don't have to believe in me in a certain way for me to uh, love you and want to not punish you forever in a fiery pit. Right. So then we get to uh, eternal punishment, which you've talked about, which makes sense to me for the same idea. Uh, and I've long thought this just philosophically, separate yeah. sort of it and apart from Mormonism, which is the idea, but influenced, of course, by Mormonism, that uh, it just seems illogical, if I may say so, Captain. Yeah. It seems illogical to punish infinitely people for what are finite sins. Yeah. You know, I can't do an infinite sin. I don't know about you. You sound like you've been around the I've block tried. a few times. Yeah. <laughs> but I think these are all probably finite sins that we commit. And to, to punish someone or give any kind of consequence infinitely for a finite sin seems a little bit of overkill. Yeah. So I agree with you. Have you ever thought in your mind how interesting it is that at least on these two subjects with the Trinity and with eternal punishment, that your journey has sort of led you all the way back to Mormon beliefs in these regards. Yeah, I've, I've considered that. And, uh, and so I do have to uh, give a nod to some of the thinking that was brought to the table by Smith and Young and others, uh, because I don't think they were entirely wrong. I don't think uh, they were wrong on everything the way you know evangelicals want to make it out. I think he had, uh, Joseph Smith had insights on things that were good and reasonable. The problem I have relative to Mormonism and its contribution to these things is that um, 
Joseph Smith did not s- substantiate his views through a biblical worldview. He substantiated them from his revelations. And to me, I want to substantiate them from a biblical worldview, which uh, I didn't seek, set out to do. It happened to me uh, by people sending me certain things and over the years, me just looking into those things and then testing them against uh, what the Bible says. So I know people have rubbed against the Bible, et cetera, and I don't think it's word perfect and all that, but I do think that the basics are there. And I do think that's, this is the important point for me is that uh, I can reasonably show through a contextual understanding of scripture and the Greek that hell is not eternal, that he has come back and that God is not a Trinity. So it's not like I'm another Smith coming up with revelations just saying, no, no, it's not that it's this, it's that it's, I will use the Bible through the teachings to show it. And if you can disprove the things, great, I'll change. I've changed on things, but I have yet to see uh, someone be able to disprove them. So uh, that's important for me to be able to say that the Bible will sustain whatever view you have, because that I think is something we have as a tool to judge whether something's errant or uh so it sounds like you have come back to Mormonism, or at least Mormon thought, in another way about the Bible containing errors or not being perfect, you said. Is that right? Yeah, and there's no way those, those copies we have in our hands are perfect. There is absolutely, I mean, I can give, we have a book out and it shows you like dozens and dozens and dozens of things. And, and yeah, no way is it perfect, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's good enough. And I don't think we needed some extra uh, biblical books like the Book of Mormon or, or Doctrine and Covenants of Pearl of Great Price to help us. I think the, the, the seekers will find, and I think the messages are central in there, enough for us to understand what the, what the truth is. Okay. Well, you may have answered my next question, but if you have, you have. And if not, you can give it another go. Let's just pretend I'm a Mormon caller into your talk show. Um, yeah. If the Bible has, is not perfect and has mistakes in it, then my question for you, and I'm sure you've thought about this a lot already, is how is it that you're able to determine which is correct and which is not sufficiently to be able to support a salvation theology or soteriology on it? Well, I mean, the way I see it are there are people in this world who will do the homework And they are led and moved to do the homework. And I can benefit by that homework. And then I can test that homework by the Greek. And I can test their homework and their assertions by original, uh, the most original manuscripts. I can test it by a comparative analysis with all the different versions. And when you do that, you can see much more clearly what was actually being said than just reading it in the English and saying, this is right and this is wrong. So you have to do your homework. And Jesus was emphatic that you got to seek to find. And that I really believe that people who are his seek him. I think he loves those who don't. And he gives them life and he doesn't put them in hell afterward. They have what they want. He gives them what they want. But seekers will discover his hidden truths as they pursue him through a conscientious study of his word by the spirit. And I know everyone, everyone will say, well, I do that and I come up with a different conclusion. And for that reason, I say doctrine doesn't matter because we can all study our brains out and come to different conclusions. Love has to trump and triumph over doctrinal assertions. I think that's really, really an interesting answer. And can I just tell you about the Sunday school class that I taught once? It was around 15 years ago or so. And I taught a rather unusual gospel doctrine class in Sunday school. And as you know, that's for the adults. And I taught that for four years, the full cycle through all the standard works. But one day I come in and I think, because I'm always trying to change it up and make it interesting, Mm -hmm. which is radical enough when you're talking about Mormon Sunday school. But I try and make it interesting. And I figure I'm going to talk about Bible bashing. Because Bible bashing is a thing that Mormons really, really like, but they're not supposed to, Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, but I talk about Bible bashing and I talk about it in a general sense. And we're talking about the Bible. 
you know, you do Old Testament one year, New Testament the next year. And for whatever reason, I bring up uh, Bible bashing, ask how many people know about Bible bashing. Everybody knows about it, right? And what I suggest to them is not whether Bible bashing is good or bad or productive or unproductive. But the question I ask is, how is it that Bible bashing? Oh, oh let me back up. Let me back up because I described what happens. This is a Bible bash. You ready? Okay. A Bible bash is... I'm right, and here's the verses in the Bible that support me. Uh, and the other side says, no, I'm right, and here's the verses in the Bible that support me. And then they discount or explain away your verses that you've used to support you. Then it right. goes back to you, and you say, no, I'm right. And then you explain away the verses that they've used to support them, and you reemphasize the verses that support you. And this can go on as long as people want to go on. It's like an endless game of war, you know, with cards. You got oh, two yeah. cards and you're playing War Forever, the most boring card game in the world. Well, everybody understands that. Yeah, no matter what the subject is, that's the format of a Bible bash. So then I raise the question, has anybody here ever thought of why it is that a Bible bash is even possible? Mm. Because we're not talking about idiots on the other side. I mean, we're talking about smart people, reasonable people on both sides of the equation. They're not demonic. They're not uh, evil people. They just see things differently. And my whole question was, um, if God had wanted to, could he not have given us a set of scriptures or writings that was so clear that we would all be led to the same conclusion? And most people agree with that in theory. I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but most people agree with that in theory. And then I say, well, obviously he didn't do that. Otherwise, there would be no Bible bashing. Mm -hmm. Everybody would see it the same way. And I'm not sure what the ultimate point was I was leading to with that whole thing, but I remember that example that I get, gave and what you were saying about the doctor not mattering because reasonable people of good faith who are really trying to find the truth in the Bible can and frequently do come to different conclusions, even on important subjects. Yes. Yes. Your point is so important uh, because in my opinion, because um, uh, I think you, you actually, that was ingenious for you to say, to teach that that way, because obviously God could have given us something completely didactic and clear, but in, not, in doing that, he made his seekers and his children and his people have to learn to get along and have to choose love over doctrinal certainty. And in religion, that is one of the most difficult things to do. But until the faiths will back down and allow people to believe, think, say, and practice what they want and just teach love and support and community, we're going to be at odds with each other. And I just, I, I, I think that God, like you said, could have done it, but he didn't because how else will we learn to love? I don't think we would know how to love as, as Christians if we had pure doctrinal rules because the law kills. So for that reason, I, I am certain that it's a subjective relationship that we have with God, not objectively driven and demanded. It's subjectively understood and incorporated into each individual. You're going to die alone. I'm dying alone. We will go to our maker and it's going to be between he and I, not me and the pastor and the group I'm with. And it's a subjective faith. And I think Christ made it that way. Really quickly, God said in the Old Testament, and you know, to bring up scripture that can be debated, in that day, meaning after the wrap up of that age, he will write his laws on the minds and hearts of all people. And no man will say to his neighbor, know the Lord, know the Lord, for all will know me. And I think we all are in that position. And we are all responsible for what we want out of this life relative to our relationship with him. And everyone's road is going to be different, and it's going to be speckled with different views and practices. But by God, did we love? Did we love? And I have come to see that that is the ultimate. I believe, I've come to see, I've come to believe that's the ultimate expression of being a, a person of faith. Agape love. Let me bring up there, because that always reminds me of the parable of the sheep and the goats, which I think is in Matthew, is it 25? 24, 25, yeah. Yeah, I think it's right. Uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's right around there somewhere. It's in the, in, the, in the end of Matthew there somewhere. But it's this very long, very well-known parable 
And of course, it's the idea about um, I was hungry and you fed me and or I was hungry and you didn't feed me and the sheep and the goats, right? Yeah. And uh, as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Or as you have not done it unto the least of my brethren, you have not done it unto me. Right. And the thing that's really interesting to me about that entire parable is that at least taking that parable and not looking at any other parables, but that one parable which seems to talk about final judgment, whether you end up on the right hand of God or on the left hand of God, there is absolutely nothing about doctrine in it. There's absolutely nothing about belief in it. Amen. There's really nothing about Jesus in it. And I, I don't mean to be offensive, but it just, and Jesus as far as doctrine, let's put it that way, okay? Yeah, you're right. All it is is, are you good to people who need you because when you do that, you're doing that to God. And are you not good to people who need you, the marginalized, the dispossessed, the downtrodden? Are you not good to them? Because if you're not good to them, then you're not doing it to God. And really, in the final analysis, that's all that matters. In the final analysis, amen. And I, it is such a great insight uh, because we think it's all the other stuff. And, and that's why our view, what we teach is, uh, it's not the denomination. It's not even the uh, faction of faith. You can be even an atheist, but you don't realize that it is God in you that is leading you to love others, that is going to justify you uh, before God at the end over the Christian who uh, professes Christ but has no love. It's the love. The Hindus have it. The Buddhists have it. I believe Christ has made that possible by his shed blood for all people to understand the love, but they may not know him. Ultimately, they will. So I give him the credit and I make him making it always possible. Uh, so it's not universalism, but it certainly opens the door that if there's a Muslim family and they love others the way you just described, they are justified before God, and they will learn that it was Christ in them that allowed them to love. So then, if we're going to be closing now and wrapping up, I want to get to the very heart, and I think that you've been there, of your message. And it sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that your message is not, certainly not about doctrine, certainly not about a particular church. As I understand it, you would think that there could be uh, saved individuals even within Mormonism, correct? Oh, sure. Okay. And within even these other churches that are perhaps persecuting you. Sure. And outside of any church. Yes. And in non-Christian religions. Yes. Okay. So does that mean then that really even this idea of a sinner's prayer to Jesus in somewhat of a codified way is an actual event happening, which happened to you and Charles Stanley on the radio, but that even that experience is not necessarily required in order to be justified before God. No, uh, simply because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So if it happens here, it's one thing. If it happens there, it's another. It's not forced. It's not mandated. It will happen because people will come to see what he's done and their knees will bow and tongues confess. But I think that the value of me having my sinner's prayer, or at least coming to that experience by whatever means that comes for somebody, the value is in having a relationship with God through Christ here, because there, that is how he brings us from being creations to being children, and from being uh, fleshly, self-serving souls to being people who are led by his spirit to love others more. And that's my own, the only reason why we preach is that to help people come to learn to love better and more and, and not to become dogmatic, but to just love in a greater capacity, which I think happens when Christ comes into you. I think that is a great message that you have. I wish you all the luck with your future ministry, and I hope it grows. I think this is a message that the world needs. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it will grow. I'm not sure that uh, it's a message the world wants. We seem to love fighting and we, lead, we seem to love being angry at everybody for their beliefs. But I would like to say in closing, thank you for having me on Radio Free, Free Mormon. And uh, I also want to thank you for 
uh, I want to say this just as an assessment from, from my personal perspective of uh, listening to you, that you're a seeker and that seekers find and that you understand grace and that you're serving a really important message to your viewers. And I think your wisdom that you've uh, acquired. Did you cut me off? No, you froze. And you know, I, this is the worst time for you to freeze right in the middle of this encomium that you're, <laughs> that you're giving to Radio Free Mormon and you freeze and get cut off about wisdom that I've acquired. And, and your knowledge applied is so beneficial to the world. I, I, I think this open dialogue that you do and the inner uh, astute relative to the faith, you're, you're bringing up things that most people, they don't just come up with overnight, whether you've had a show or not. You've acquired this stuff by, by thinking about it for a long time, like, and, and, and that's obvious. And I think, I, I believe the living God is using you uh, to help people to examine their faith. And I'm really grateful for Radio Free Mormon. And I pray that you will grow and continue to, to touch people with these very important conversations. Well, thank you so much, Sean McCraney. Once again, it's Heart of the Matter on Monday nights and Tuesday nights. Monday night's a short show. Tuesday night is a longer show with call-ins. I know I have a number of my listeners who resonate very much to prior podcasts I've had with Born Again Mormons on the show and talking about the Book of Mormon and how it teaches about being born again as an actual event that happens at a certain date, a certain place, a certain time, as opposed to the interpretation that's been put on it now by church leaders, mm -hmm. contrary to the Book of Mormon, that the yeah. that being born again is not something that happens. It's not an event. Instead, it's a process. Right. It's a slow, gradual process, you, and you don't even notice it happening is the message we get from the LDS church today. Uh, which once again contradicts the Book of Mormon, but as I put it, they teach that being born again is a long process so that you don't really notice that it's not happening. Right, right. Uh, can I interrupt one more time? Sure. And I want to thank two of your uh, listeners, uh, Scott, uh, the attorney I think we both know here in Salt Lake City, and Danny. They have pushed for me to get in contact with you. They are both big fans of your uh, program and of you. And uh, they both, you know, are really impressed with what you do. And they've said, Sean, you got to talk to him. You got to talk to him. So I'm really grateful that they pushed through and, uh, and just wanted to give them a shout out. Well, thank you so much. You know, maybe we can do this again sometime and you can interview me. Yes, I would love that. And I would love it if we get the techno technology going and show up and have live call in and people could call in and ask questions of you, ask questions of me, and we could really mix it up. I look forward to it, my brother. All right. Thank you again so much, Sean McCraney, Heart of the Matter. Thank you. God bless. God bless you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that concludes our interview with Sean McCraney, a very interesting fellow who has traveled a very interesting path and I think has a number of twists and turns probably still ahead of him. That's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air.